If you agree with the next statement that I'm going to make, I want you to clap your hands. Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> Mother Earth, planet Earth, blue planet, the water planet. Our Earth is covered uh, with, with water two-thirds of its surface. It has a lot of water. So how much water does it really have? It has. 330 million cubic miles of water, a large number. If you took all of that water and you poured it on the footprint of the United States, you would get a lake 90 miles deep. That's how much water we have. But terrestrial life, including us humans, we need fresh water. And so how much fresh water do we have? Well, it turns out that most of the water on the planet is saline, only 3% of the water on the planet is fresh water. And of that 3%, only 1% is surface water. And the rest of the water is actually frozen or underground. So fresh water is a very precious resource. We're not, we don't have nearly as much fresh water as water. In fact, one in six people on the planet, one in six people on the planet do not have access to clean drinking water. That's a pretty astonishing figure. And this map shows you, in fact, the degree of water scarcity across the world, across the globe. The yellow, orange, and red regions are areas of the world that today experience water scarcity. So we know that fresh water is extremely precious. But even more precious than fresh water is clean fresh water. Because of our global air currents and the fact that 2 thirds of our planet is covered in water, we have contaminated our globe with chemicals that have been used from industry for the last century. These chemicals have contaminated top predators from the North Pole to the South Pole and all the areas in between. Now, this is just a handful of chemicals, and we happen to know with certainty that this handful of chemicals causes harm to humans and wildlife. And so the UN banned these chemicals some years ago. So we, we took action on this handful of chemicals. But it's just a handful of chemicals. How many other chemicals are out there, and should we be worried about them? Well, let's look at the universe of chemicals. So how many chemicals are used in commerce today? This shows, a, this is sort of a cartoon of all the different chemicals that are, are registered for use, not regulated, an important distinction. These are chemicals that are registered for use in the United States. And it includes about 40,000 polymers. These are not considered terribly harmful or, or threatening. They're such large size that they are too big to pass through biological cell membranes. So we don't really concern ourselves with those 40,000 polymers. But we have about 42,000 industrial chemicals that have properties such that they do have the potential to cause um, adverse uh, human harm. And then we also have about 12,000 chemicals that are pharmaceuticals and pesticides and uh, cosmetic additives and food additives. So together, we've got about 60,000 chemicals in this universe that have the potential to get into the environment and have the potential to cause harm. So in the United States, we regulate chemicals based on having, a, uh, having lots of science and known certainty that there is a potential risk of, of both exposure and harm from a chemical. And we have to have that science in order to regulate chemicals and to protect human health and public health. And so we regulate chemicals uh, from the Superfund program. Superfund is also known as CERCLA. That's the, uh, this is for Dustin. These are, I've got lots of acronyms for you in this slide. We have CERCLA. We have our waste disposal laws, or RECRA. We regulate chemicals through the Clean Water Act. We regulate chemicals through the Safe Drinking Water Act. And we regulate chemicals through the Clean Air Act. And if you take all of those regulated chemicals and you form a list and you take out the duplicates, we regulate about 370 chemicals. So does this mean that the other 59,600 chemicals, 59,600 chemicals are safe? Absolutely not. It means we don't have enough information to actually know if they pose a hazard or not. So science evolves. And over time, since we've regulated these chemicals, we have also been able to discover new chemicals in the environment because our advances in analytical chemistry have progressed, have evolved, so we can measure minute quantities of chemicals in the environment. So we have identified new chemicals, if you will. 
We also, toxicology has also advanced, and so we've identified new effects from chemicals. The benchmark used to be cancer. Now we have many other um, outcomes, adverse outcomes, that we have to be concerned with. And finally, we also make new chemicals all the time. This is, a, this is an evolving field. Together, these chemicals are called chemicals of emerging concern. This is a group of chemicals that are not yet regulated, but potentially can cause harm and can potentially get into the environment. And if you look through that universe of chemicals and you kind of sort through and say which ones are the chemicals of emerging concern that are not yet regulated, it's about 500 to 1,000 chemicals. So note that the number of unregulated, potentially harmful chemicals is two to three times the number of regulated chemicals, which means we have a lot of homework to do. Now, why should we be concerned with these contaminants? Well, we know that some of them can cause reproductive problems. They can affect growth. They can affect development. They can affect organ health, such as kidney and liver issues. They can contribute to diseases, such as obesity. They can affect behavior. Now, all of these are insidious. They're all bad. These are not good effects. But the worst effect of all is that sometimes these effects can be transgenerational. And so if you have a mother and a mom has been exposed to chemicals in her lifetime, she may not have any effect whatsoever. She lives a perfectly normal and healthy life. But what happens is her kid has a disease or a, she has, the, the kid has something wrong with her at birth, has something appear as a medical problem when she goes through puberty or a, develops an adult disease later in her life. And even more insidious and really alarming is that these diseases can then show up in the next generation of, that, of, the, of the daughter. And so the grandchildren of the mother that was exposed exhibit the diseases and the outcomes, but not the mother herself. So this is called transgenerational effects, and they're very much thought to be related to the epigenetic mechanism that Dr. Mohan talked about earlier. This is why we should be concerned. So where do these chemicals come from? Why are they in our environment, and how can we stop that? Well, they come from a variety of things, but unfortunately, most of them come from our everyday life. They come from our use and disposal of beauty products, of household cleaning agents, of our use and disposal of drugs. They come from our food containers and our water containers. They, they, many of these chemicals are current use pesticides. They're the pharmaceuticals used in, in livestock, in commercial livestock production. And they, of course, occur in industrial effluent. And because these are universal things that we use in our everyday lives, they end up in our waste streams, and then they end up in our sewage treatment plants and our wastewater treatment plants. And the wastewater treatment plants don't remove these chemicals, and they get put into the environment, into our lakes and rivers and streams. And so this shows how just our everyday living produces chemicals in our waste stream, and that's how they get into our water supply is through our wastewater treatment. Are we exposed to these chemicals? Yes, we are. A recent study by the US Geological Survey looked at the drinking water source for a, about um, a third of the United States, and they looked for 55 different contaminants of emerging concern. And what they found routinely was 11 compounds, nine of which are pharmaceuticals, one was a pesticide, and one is a flame retardant. And so we do know that we're exposed to these chemicals. What we absolutely don't know is what this means in terms of public health. We do not know what the potential harm is from drinking water that contains these chemicals. We absolutely do not know that. But what we do know with certainty is that these chemicals can cause effects in fish and wildlife. Many studies have shown this. This is a recent study also done by the US Geological Survey that looked at fish health across the entire United States by looking at major river basins. They looked at nine major river basins out of 11 in the United States, and they looked for a condition known as intersex. And they found intersex in, in one third of the sites that they looked at. This is an alarming number. Intersex is when you have female ovarian tissue and male testicular tissue in the same individual fish, in one fish. So this fish is definitely not normal, and this fish definitely cannot reproduce. And that, this condition was found in fish from one-third of the sites that they studied. So what can we do about this? Now that I've depressed you just before lunch, what can we do about this? 
The current paradigm is that we manufacture chemicals, we do research to manufacture chemicals, and then we sell them to consumers, and consumers use them at alarming rates, and we put it all in the trash when we're done. And so we have a lot of waste, and unfortunately, the chemicals that are in that waste can leach into the environment. And so, and then we end up with a problem. And so what do we need to do? We need to reduce the waste, but most importantly, we need to reduce the toxicity of that waste. And how do we do that? Well, we have to move upstream, pun intended. We have to educate consumers. We have to get all of you and all of your friends and all of your neighbors and family and everyone else you know, we have to get consumers to demand safer products, to demand products that have safer chemicals that were used to manufacture them. So we have to educate consumers and get them to speak with their pocketbooks. We have to make sure that Production is, is made more greener, if you can. So we're talking about green manufacturing here. We're talking about making safer products. And then we need R&D to, to, to find substitute chemicals that are safer to go into those products. And this is where green chemistry and green manufacturing come into play. So we have to get, we, we can't just clean up the waste. We have to get rid of the toxicity of the waste by moving upstream and getting these chemicals out of our society. Now this is a societal fix. And I'm sure you're sitting there going, well, what can I do about that? I don't know any R&D chemists. Well, the thing is, is that there are things that you can do as an individual. You can learn where does your water come from, what's in your water, and where does it go. You can vote for legislators and decision makers that care about public health and the environment with a top priority, that that's their number one priority, not their fifth priority. You can join your watershed association. You can help the MPCA with their volunteer monitoring programs of lakes and rivers and streams. You can advocate for green chemistry, for safer products, for, um, for making sure that public health is protected. You can contribute financially with your energy, with your, uh, with your service, with your skill set. There are many ways to contribute. You can teach your friends and your family and your neighbors about water literacy, about what's in their consumer products. You can clean up your, your watershed, your local watershed, and you can clean out your medicine cabinet safely. You can take time to enjoy your water resources. You can build and create a safe and healthy community. Each and every one of you can contribute to that. You can care about the next generation, and you can imagine. And imagining is probably the most important thing you can do. I ask you to imagine a sustainable water future. Thank you.